Take your hymnals, if you would, and turn to 394. 394. out this morning. Got quite a few that are out. I hope they're not sick. I hope they're uh, some other reason other than that. So far as I know, they're not. But it's good to have y'all with us this morning. Good to have a couple back there. They're not visitors. I think they've been before, but we're good to have them back with us this morning. Uh, today, uh, well, let me go get that record. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Uh, opening prayer this morning, if you'll let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning and we pray for those who are not able to be here today, for whatever the reason. Lord, we pray for those that are here today. We pray that each heart, each mind would be touched in some way that only you know that it needs to be touched in the way that you know it needs. Lord, we pray not only for those that have come here this day and for this church, but Lord, we pray for all the churches. We pray for the country. We pray for the many needs that we face in, this, in these trying times. We ask your guidance and your blessings and your forgiveness. We pray, Lord, for this service which is about to take place. We pray that your Holy Spirit will be poured out among us, Lord. That uh, you would bless each one that come, and from words or the songs or something to say it in some way will touch each heart in a way that only you know it needs to be touched. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Our opening hymn this morning is 368. My hope is built. Oh, Christ. 
Thank you. taking their seats this morning uh, let us take a moment and look at our prayer list uh, we have the Chuck Sutton family uh, the Hattie Shackerford family do we have updates on others this morning or others that we need to add to our prayer list this morning No updates, no others we need to add. All right. <coughs> Soon as they get seated, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for the privilege again to be in your house, place of worship, Father. We ask your blessings, Father, this morning on this service. <laughs> Father, we pray for those on our prayer list. We pray the needs that they have in their lives. We pray not only for those individual, individuals on our prayer list, but for the families that are involved around them, for the caregivers that are involved around them. We pray for your healing, Lord, your physical healing and where needed, your spiritual healing. Father, we pray also for those in our community that are homebound, those that are serving our armed forces, our police and government, Lord. We pray especially for our government now, Lord, for the nursing homes, 
We pray for unspoken needs. Lord, we pray for the upcoming election, that you would guide each one within their hearts and their minds on which, who they should vote for and how they should vote, Lord, that you would let your Holy Spirit lead them. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. On the way of announcements this morning, uh, there's quite a lot on the back. Uh, the Ruby Theater trip, so far as I know right now, was planned ahead of time, but is off. So far as I know, nobody took care of tickets or so forth. So that will not happen. Uh, there are 23 things of peanut in the back, peanut brittle that we need to sell if we can, and we need to sell the cookbooks in the back if we can. I don't know how many of those there are. I understand that at the Fall Festival, we made $7,578.71 or 78 cents. I can't read my own writing. <laughs> the, uh, the candy cleared, cleared around $3,000, and the youth made 170 to 180 somewhere in that range with their hot dogs and stuff. Uh, the rest of the... They are, uh, other than I make note, d due to the practice for the play and the children uh, in and out and getting that over with, and then they were going to have choir practice afterwards, I think, you was talking about that, uh, we're going to postpone Bible study unless y'all want to come from 10 to 11 <laughs> or 9 to 10. It would be late. So... Till, till the Christmas play is over we, we will postpone Bible study. I think everything else on there is pretty well covered. I think. Well, yeah, that's... Did I leave that off? I thought I had that on there. I can't even find it. <laughs> oh, yeah, Greenville Wesley at Church Singers. Next Sunday, cover dish. Don't forget that. And then the youth go to roller skate after that. Roller skating after that. After the roller skating, Rocky Mountain on the 13th. All right. <clears throat> Can we have our ushers to come forward? Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you again this morning for the privilege to be here. Lord, we thank you for this that has been given. We pray that it would be used wisely for the glory and the building of your kingdom. Not only that portion that stays within this church, but the portion that literally goes throughout and around the world to help in many different ways, Lord. 
Uh, they help in the needy, Lord, in, in, in the people in the stormed areas, Lord, uh, people with special diseases, hospitals, Lord, uh, colleges in Africa and other places, Lord, and for the missionary work going on in there in China. Lord, we just lift all these things up to you and pray for that you, this money would be used wisely for the glory and the building of your kingdom, including that which stays here. Lord, we ask a blessing on this that has been given and a blessing on these thy children who've given. In Christ's name, amen. amen. <coughs> Remain standing as you still are, 509. sing today. That's right. I ask her not to on communion because of time. <laughs> I told the Sunday school, my wife says, now think, remember to do this or remember to say that. I can't even remember to keep up with the bulletin hard. <laughs> I said, how do you think I'm going to remember this when I get up there? There's too many things going on. Uh, before I start this morning, morning, I want to say this. Uh, I took a survey this week. Uh, I'm thinking all the Methodist pastors were surveyed and maybe some of the Methodist members of the church. But I'm sure the pastors were all surveyed. And one of the questions they asked me was, which is most important to you, social issues or soul winning? It was real easy. I stay out, if you hadn't noticed, I try to stay out of social issues. I don't know of any better way to break a church up than to get to talking about social issues in the pulpit. Because I'm guaranteeing you, every one of you out there think different from what I think, or some of you do anyway. And you're entitled to your thoughts. Soul winning is the most important part of this church. That's my first and number one priority. And then if you're out soul winning and you're praying to God, he'll lead you who you need to vote for and who you don't. I don't need to try to tell you. You know, to sit, you, if any of you out there are feeble of mind and you need a little help, then come and I'll help you in confidential, but I'll give you both sides. But unless you're feeble of mind, you know who to vote for or what to do. It's something you have to decide. And I also those father told them, you know, when social issues come into the church, and I've seen this at conference, it divides it. It divides it. If I had my way, 
conference would never bring up another social issue. Period. Agree? I mean, it's divisive. We need to get a planning meeting together, too. I need to talk to Jennifer after Christmas. I think she's got all right, got her hands full right now, <laughs> but we'll do that, too. Uh, President Roosevelt, or uh, Paul, let me rephrase that. Paul said as President Ro Ro Roosevelt, Paul saying the same thing. I, maybe this is where President Roosevelt got it from, was Paul. In reality, if you have Jesus Christ in your life and in your heart, you have nothing to fear but fear itself. Now, he didn't put Jesus Christ part in it. He said, all we have is to fear is fear itself. As a Christian, all you've got to fear is fear itself. God's still in control. Whether we think things are going like we want them or not, and they're probably not, but he's still in control. Nothing is going to happen that is not his will or that he does not allow to happen. Now, does he allow punishment? Yes, he does, <laughs> as well as blessings. Okay, 2 Thessalonians <coughs> 2. Now, we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind. He's talking to you today. Church, be not soon shaken in mind. Don't be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter S from us. In other words, they did not send that letter to the church. Somebody else outside troublemakers has sent something to them. In other words, don't be troubled by social issues, whatever that's been sent into the church. Don't be troubled by it. S from us. Uh, and what was telling them that people at the time uh, in Jerusalem were telling them the judgment's already come. <laughs> you just lost out. <laughs> and uh, he says, Go on, say, don't, don't believe it. As the day of Christ is at hand, it has not come, but it's close. It's in God's time, and it's always close. You're one heartbeat away. <laughs> Guarantee it. When your heart starts, stops beating, you're on the way there. <laughs> and what difference is it going to matter then where I'm going or they're going or she's going? You're gone. <laughs> as Paul saying, you know, but the judgment has not come. They were afraid that they had died, and, and, and their thinking was that if you die, then you can't be caught up alive. They, 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 they had lost part of their thinking, you see. As you're dead, you're gone. You're going to miss, you're going to miss, the, miss the coming of God. <clears throat> Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away. And that man, person of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, Satan's representative. And I've come to believe that these people are in every generation. Satan's representative is always there. Uh, we look back at the church and there's always been up high, high in spirit, descent, down in spirit, or, or either persecution. Let no man deceive you. Unless the church falls away, unless you fall away from God, you're all right. <laughs> Paul's trying to tell them. Let no man deceive you, and that man of sin is revealed son of perdition. In other words, Satan's representative. We have Satan's representatives. They're alive and well. There's more than one right now on this earth. There are people who sold their soul to the devil. Uh, this is just plain and simple. Uh, they look at, when you turn and look after self only, when there's nothing to import it to you but self, self, myself, me, me. You better come to the altar and have a silent prayer. Uh, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. Let no man deceive you by any means, 
Verse 3, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. And that man, person of sin, be revealed, the son of perdition, one that's Satan's representative, who opposeth and exalteth him or herself above all that is God, called God, or that is worshipped, or that he or she as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing him or herself that he or she is God. When somebody comes and says, I got all the answers, they ain't personally out saying, but I got all the answers, everything's going to be all right, step away from them. <laughs> they ain't got all the answers. Guarantee you, nobody, nobody's got all the answers. Watch out for these people, and they come, they come, they have come throughout the church history, and the church throughout history has risen and fallen, risen and fallen. Um. Uh, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he or she or she said it in the temple. Now this verse is referring to, to, to them at their, in their time. Who said it in the temple of God, showing himself or herself that she is God. Ah, uh, I hope there are no pastors out there that think they're God. The Roman emperors at that time, though, in this time in history, had declared that Caesar was God. And Caesar, the law was passed that Caesar would be put in every place of worship, a statue of him. In other words, if we were in Rome and that was coming about today, we would be forced to put a statue of Caesar up here on the altar. This is where this church was at. Because uh, Caesar's a God. You go and worship your God if you want to, but remember Caesar's also a God. <laughs> Uh, and the church is troubled. It's troubled. Verse 5, Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. Paul's talking to a group of people in danger of losing hope of Jesus' second coming. Some have died. What will they do? And most that thought Jesus was going to return in their lifetime. The early Christians literally thought Jesus was going to come back in their lifetime. He said, soon. Ah. <laughs> uh, Soon. Soon can be. How long? Depends on the person that's saying what, it, what they're thinking. Going on to 2 Thessalonians 13. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, Paul is saying, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. God has chosen and will purify you if you come to him, if you accept that, that, that. You see, God wants everybody. So if you want to put it that way, God's chosen everybody. But you don't stick unless you in your heart say, yeah, I want it. I mean, you can choose to be my friend. But if I turn my back on it and don't want it, you don't want my friend, are you? You can still love me or whatever. You see what I'm saying? You, we ha each individual's rituals, we fix to take communion. <coughs> rituals will not save you. It's not, they're good, they're nice, they're pretty. We should, we should do them to remembrance in remembrance. But they won't save you. You can take the Lord's Supper until you die. If you haven't asked Jesus to come into your life, and if you haven't surrendered to him, you're going to hell. Pure, plain, and simple. I can say, if we should change it, if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, it's the body and the blood. <laughs> because if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, it's a piece of bread and a little bit of juice. <laughs> and no more. Only if you're saved. Only if you've asked God to come live within your heart. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now, Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which have loved us and have given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. In other words, through grace, you're going to face trying times. But that's all right. Stand firm. God's still in control. If you know him, he's in control. Let me put it up. in control of your life. Comfort your hearts and establish you in every good work and work and word. Comfort 
Comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. The word of God for the people of God. <laughs> Christians in Paul's day, as I've already said, they were expecting Jesus' return before Jerusalem was destroyed. When he predicted, Jesus predicted the destruction of Jerusalem, they expected him to come back before or right after Jerusalem was destroyed. And Paul was describing the end of the world, i.e. the second coming of Christ, that it still had not yet occurred. It's not, not happening. Jews, Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD, but Paul said there would be great suffering and trouble ahead for all Christians in every generation. The Christians were suffering greatly in Paul's day and time. They had started out now, churches are established, and uh, Christians in almost every community now are being persecuted. Uh, people don't want them in the neighborhood. A lot like today. Schools don't want them. Teachers don't want them. School teachers don't want them. These young ones, new ones, they don't have nothing about God in them. They're all secular. I mean, and, and they're turning out secular young people. Uh, money, get ahead. That's all they're worried about. Uh, jobs. You know, Jerusalem has not yet been destroyed here, but Paul said that there will still be great suffering ahead. Paul said it's going to be even greater suffering. You, per you think you're being persecuted now. Paul said it's going to come again even greater suffering. God is going to winnow out the believers and the false believers. Oh, he, he, what did he say? You're winning and fork, he's throwing you up in the air. Well, you throw up in the air, you, you, you hit kind of hard, don't you? <laughs> But the chaff blows away and the wheat, the good grain, falls to the ground. Christians are the good grain. The chaff are the sinners, blown away by the wind. <laughs> Paul is not predicting the end of time or when Christ will return. Paul's basically saying, I don't know, but I'm telling you there's trouble and suffering in every generation. And you can go back down through history. Uh, the... Uh, <laughs> church was persecuted first by people other than the Jews. If you want a Jew, then the Gentiles were persecuted by the Jews and by Gentiles. Uh, the early church, the Catholics, persecuted it heavily. Um, I've told you the story of the uh, uh, King of England changed wives. The Catholic burnt the Christians at the stake. When the Christian queen come in, she burnt the Catholics at the stake, <laughs> which was most guilty. Church has been persecuted, and the church has persecuted. It's not, his hands are not clean. Paul is simply saying that evil will not prevail, that evil exists in this world. It's going to exist until God comes back. And Paul is trying to tell the church that, look, evil is, going, is, is not going to prevail because Christ is going to return and judge those people. Evil is not going to win at the end. What was the saying? I, something about how it goes or something, but I know at, at the end, I, I'm, I know who's going to win at the end. Well, I know who's going to win at the end. I know the end of the game. I know the end of the game, if you want to call it that. I know how the ending's going to be. Those that are persecuting don't. It's our job to get out and tell them. Paul is simply saying that you're going to have evil in the world. It's devil, the devil, the devil is, is just as hard at work as God is. Trying, I don't know what he thinks he's going to do with all these souls he's going to do, unless he thinks he's going to overwhelm hell with so many of them <laughs> that it won't hold them. I mean, he, he thinks he's trying to... Be, Satan literally, I think, is trying to build an army, a spiritual army, thinking he's still going to overthrow God. This was Satan. Remember, this is what Satan did in the beginning. Satan was an angel, got so powerful and so strong, he, he sought to overthrow God. And God cast him out of heaven. And at the final judgment, he's going to attempt that. He's going to make that attempt one more time. He's thinking, I reckon he's getting us. And God's going to throw them all in the lake of fire, we're told. Eternal torment, where they'll burn forever. Ain't going to die. They're going to burn. They're going to be in pain. They're going to be in sorrow. They're going to be in torture and torment. 
listen to what Mark, what Mark goes on and says is going to happen. And it's happening today. In, uh, in the Middle East, brother shall betray brother to death. Father, son, the son to, and the children shall rise up against their parents. <coughs> um, they shall cause them to be put to death. Ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that shall endure to the end shall be saved. This is what Paul's trying to tell the church. You're going to have evil around you. <coughs> and uh, you look at this nation. We're drifting on a downhill slope. And you wonder why there are more killings. You wonder why there's more drug use. You wonder why there's more fighting. You wonder how to, why there's more broken families. You, you wonder why all these things are happening. It's because people have turned their back on God. They have no morals. If you have no moral guidance, no moral compass, if you don't have, and that, that, that moral guidance and compass must be Jesus Christ living within you. If you don't know about him and you don't have him, you're like a piece of shaft being blown by the wind. Here and yonder by the whims of the world, by what's popular at this time and what's popular at that time. And I mean, none of those things save you. I mean, you go buy the latest skirt and you look back and three or four weeks or six months, it's out of date. They've changed it again. It won't make money. Same thing with men's clothes or hairstyle. I mean, and the list just goes on and on. We get caught up in the world thinking that men of this world can solve the problems. But the problem is, or women, one of these men or some of these men and women are partners with the devil. And that's in all walks of life. All walks of life. And when you tie into one that's with the devil, they're not going to do what they ought to do. They're not going to treat you like they ought to do. They're not going to be fair. They're not going to treat the world. And you can't pass a law that's going to do any different with them. Do you understand where I'm at? Paul knew that Mark predicted there would be troubled times all through history. Uh, the church is being persecuted. They're demanding that they, all your churches worship the emperor now. So you can see their dilemma. That's breaking the law. You don't bow down to the emperor when you come in and say, Hail Caesar. <laughs> you broke the law. Hitler tried the same thing. Hitler did away with all the preachers. The ones that would not knuckle under and preach his doctrine. Uh, the ones that didn't, they were put in prison. Eventually, they were killed. The preachers were killed for standing up for Jesus Christ. This was one of Hitler's one. Of my, see, Hitler understood that once you destroy the church, then there's no moral compass. Jesus is gone, out of life. and you can get them to do what? Commit genocide. Shoot down men and women and children. Just blindly shoot them down. Kill them. Throw them in pits. Dead or alive. Don't make no deal. Put them in gas chambers. But Hitler knew first you had to get rid of the church. Because the church was preaching against him. <coughs> this is what happens when you let an evil person get in charge. I honestly believe that some of these evil people actually really do make a pact with the devil. Paul says, but we don't know when it's going to come. Mark goes on to say it in verse 12, 21, uh, chapter 12, verse 21, and then if any man shall say to you, lo, here is Christ, or lo, there, believe him not. For false Christ and false prophet shall rise and shall show signs and wonders to seduce, if it were possible, even let. All you got to do is go on the Christian channel today. Look through them. And I hope everybody in here is smart enough to pick out which ones are false preachers and which ones are, are preachers of preaching the Word of God. Some are preaching the Word of God and <laughs> some are in it for self-gain. They're going to burn in hell with a lot of other people. Preacher of what he calls himself or not. Uh, you can tell right quick. Uh, 
Anytime a preacher says you got to, you, you got to tithe to, to be saved, mm, nothing in the Bible about that. It says tithe. It asks you to do. But if you don't tithe and everything else is right with God, you have nothing to worry about. I don't ask for money. Except in the... I'll ask the double offering sometime when I take it up for the flood victims and stuff. At Christmas, we'll take up another offering. There's still a lot of people out of their homes and all, they've lost everything. And um, I don't usually do that, but I'll take, we'll take up a second offering come December for Christians, for, for, not for Christians, for the people that are out. Uh, we don't make any distinction when we go out to help those people. Uh, we just help the community. Uh, and whatever we take up at those offerings, we will 100% go to that purpose. It will not go anywhere else in any, in any, to pay for anything. Um, we've already taken up one, and uh, we took up two, but they called it one. But uh, <clears throat> you're going to have false prophets with you. Like I said, just turn the television on if you don't believe you got them, and roll through and see what they're interested in most. Anytime a church is most interested in money, then it's no longer a church. I mean, if something happened out here and the lights won't on and you still want to be here, and if I'm able, I'll be here. Lights or no lights. <laughs> won't matter. I mean, if it gets at night, we had candles before we light candles. What I'm trying to say, you know, what's most important is where you stand with God. Is Jesus in your heart? And if he's there, then you're going to tithe. You're going to do what you should do, what you need to do. Um... Uh, we're going to always face persecution. Go on down in Mark and you look at uh, verse, t verse 24. But in those days, uh, after the tribulation, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. Uh, the government probably thinks they can fix that when it happens. Uh, they're going to fix global warming. It, there's a book called Forbidden Archaeology. Uh, and uh, it's about yay thick. And it has archaeological finds in it that are, that are true. That the colleges and the professors will not talk about. <laughs> it don't fit their scenario of the way they want things. Uh, one of the things I'm surprised at is now on the History Channel that's in this book. It, they, the History Channel has started, I can't believe they've done this. Do you know that there's towns and cities and villages under the ocean? They finally come out, and that, that's out so big. It was in this book several years back. Well, what does that say that the ocean's been doing? What does it say? What's the ocean been doing? Where'd the water come from? The ice pack's melting. <laughs> They're going to stop it. We might slow it up, but we ain't going to stop it. It's been happening ever since, since the place was froze up. We know now that ice was all the way down into England, all the way down into Europe was frozen solid. And it's gradually melting and rising the ocean level. If I, if I could live long enough and they stay like this long enough, you'll see New York, unless they build a dam around it, you see parts of it underwater. They'll flood unless they build a dam like Holland. They ain't gonna stop it. This is the way God set it up. This is what God intended. It's been doing it since the beginning of time. God has a plan for this earth. It was laid out the day, he, the, the day that he formed it. And he's going to follow that plan. And we can make things better in our time or worse in our time. People can make things better or worse in our time. Now, a lot of that depends on people being what they ought to be and doing the right thing. When I was in school, you had the Ten Commandments read. You recited the Lord's Prayer, whether you went to church or not. One or two religions that disagreed were allowed to either bow their heads, lay their head on it, or step out in the hall if they didn't want to do it. A lot of the teachers read the Bible. Every morning. 
Well, you know, that ain't, you, you can't do that. That's, that's teaching them bad habits. <laughs> so now we got liberal teachers teaching them drugs, dope, sex, you name it. <laughs> Sorry, miss. And a few Christian teachers that would teach, but I can't. Can't open the mouth, do they get fired? See, the church is being persecuted. Christians are being persecuted today. In this country, Christians are being persecuted by other people and by the government. By the laws that are being made. I got to rambling today and got off the subject to some, to some degree. But it's the same today as what Paul was facing. Paul was facing this same issue in this church that he's gone into. And he's, he's got this church, it's established, it, it's doing well, and now all at once all, these, all the world is closing in on them. And, and they're feeling trapped, left out. And Paul's trying to say, even if he tarries longer than your natural lifespan, even if you die, as a final note of encouragement, Paul reminds the Thessalonians that we have the assurance as Christians of God's love. We have the example that was set by Christ's steadfast, steadfastness as a temple, template of their strivings toward Christian behavior. Paul here is talking to the pillars of the church. He's telling them, us, how to, be, how to be thankful, how thankful he is for them and, and how we're to be thankful. He has brothers and sisters, stand firm, fast in the teachings that we've passed on to you. Stand firm. Don't give in. Don't give in to the pressures of this world to do this or to do that when you know better. Be different. And the time will come, that difference will pay off big time. Pays off in eternity. That's the basic message. Stand firm. There are antichrists in every generation and have been since Jesus Christ. They were running around to the churches during Paul's time. Trying to tear them down. Some of them trying to get them to follow them. Some of them even pretending to work miracles. Just like today. Just like today. Some of them guaranteeing total freedom, no boundaries. That's where the world's at today. Young people, I think, are at that. There's total freedom, no boundaries. And look at the diseases and the sickness and the hurt and the pain that's out there in people's lives. Drinking, free sex, dope. I mean, it, it, hate. The world, the world goes on and on. And they're going to be our next leaders. So th if God tarries, things are going to get worse. Unless we have a revival. And the only way to have a revival is to get back where I started at. The purpose of the church is to win souls to Christ. And only when the church wakes up, is sleeping right now, not only to this church, all the church, when we wake up, not to fight social issues, but to simply go out and win and tell other people of Jesus Christ, of His love and the salvation and eternal life. Once you do that, they'll sort the social issues out in their heads, all right. They're not going to sort those social issues out until they come to know Jesus Christ. Because they've got no guidance, no compass. Anything goes. So Paul's telling the church, stand firm. You believe in Jesus Christ. He's coming back one day. And if you die before he comes back, then your spirit's still going to be, you still, he ain't going to die. It's going to go be with him. You're going to be alive. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. God has a plan as long as you hold on to him. And in the end, as the saying goes, 
I know who's going to win the game <laughs> and who's going to lose big time. Soul winning, church, that's what we are to be about. When we do that, then the other would begin to take care of itself. I've got to quit. Take your hymnals, if you would, and turn to page 12. The Methodist Church has an open communion, which simply means that if your heart, you feel you're right with God, then you're free to take communion with us. Uh, you don't have to be a Pacific member of a church to 